Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. The answer is to return our attention to the good, to the real, to the true that is God, that is spirit, that, that is love, that is light. And how many of you know we need that more than ever? And we get to be that even for the people that don't know they need that. <sighs> it's a good time to be alive. And it's a good time to remember that the life of God lives through us. Amen? Yeah. Well, in pre-COVID days, back when people used to go to restaurants and travel, this couple was doing a road trip, and they were exploring parts of the country they'd never been to, and they were driving through East Texas, and they were kind of remarking on some of the, the town names that they were, they'd never heard anything like that. It's kind of that, you know, mixture of like Indian and um, French and, you know, Louisiana, all that <clears throat> together, excuse me, and they came across the town of Nacogdoches. And they were saying, how do you think they pronounce that? I'm not sure. And they were kind of arguing about the way how it should be pronounced. And she said, there's a G in it. And it's got to be in there somewhere. And they, they couldn't quite figure out how to say it. So they decided to stop in Nacogdoches and have lunch. And they come into a restaurant, and they're, they're enjoying their lunch. And then the waitress comes back to see if they need anything. And, and the, the wife says, honey, can you solve an argument for us? Tell us how to pronounce the name of this place and say it slowly. And she said... Chilies. <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> it has very little to do with what I'm talking about today. It is November. And every November, we like to talk about gratitude. Um, I love that we have a national holiday to give thanks and it's celebrated by people of all faiths, and even those who are not spiritual or religious. I mean, everybody is spiritual whether they know it or not, because um, we are all part of the spirit. But it's a day set aside where we, we give of the recognition of the good of life. We offer our gratitude and thanks. And today, the, the topic is called the transformational power of giving thanks. And what I want to talk about today is why it is in hard times, in times of struggle and even times of suffering, when it is harder to be grateful is the time it's most necessary and most useful and most powerful. That in this time of struggle, and I know that not everyone is affected in the same way by this year, 2020. Some people are getting through it okay, and some people are really feeling the full impact of the pandemic and the financial downturn and the, the loneliness of the isolation that many are going through. And I know some of us are just wanting to get through it. Can we just fast forward to get to the other side of it? And the answer is no. <laughs> we can't. We still have to live one day at a time. And every day that we wake up and we're still in this struggle, it is an invitation for us to return every praise to our God. And as we lift our eyes above the condition and return our, our awareness to the truth of God's power and presence, something in our consciousness shifts we become a, a vessel of God's light and power and possibility even now, even today, even in 2020. God is here. God is powerful. And God is available to you and to me to transform our lives. So the first thing I want to talk about today is the spiritual law that underlies this process, the, the power of giving thanks. And in his book, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, Deepak Chopra talks about the law of giving. 
And in that, that chapter, he talks about that whatever you want, that's what you give. Actually, I'd like to read a passage from that. Here's what he says. Practicing the law of giving is actually very simple. If you want joy, give joy to others. If you want love, learn to love. If you want attention and appreciation, learn to give attention and appreciation. If you want material affluence, help others become materially affluent. In fact, the easiest way to get what you want is to help others get what they want. When we're in pain, our generosity tends to dry up a little bit. Or is that just me? You know that, that thing that when you stub your little toe, all of your attention goes right there, and you can't remember anything else that's true about God or yourself or the power of thanksgiving or possibility. All you can think is pain. And that's true in our emotional lives, too. When we're going through something, it's hard to remember the power and the presence of God. We're focused on the pain. But what Dr. Chopra is trying to show us is that if we want something Step into the flow of that thing. Because giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. And if we can step into the givingness of it, of which we have some choice, some control. I know you control people love that control. And you do have some control. You get to choose your thoughts, your words, your actions, the way you spend your days. Where your attention goes, the energy flows, is another way of stating this spiritual law. That which you pay attention to expands in your consciousness. And consciousness is cause. This is the underlying truth of all of our teachings in unity. If you didn't get to see our Touchstone series, that was the whole thing. We did six weeks on how we can grow our consciousness of truth and demonstrate a higher um, frequency into our lived experience. Yes, this is what we're about. And so what we're trying to get to today is that even when it hurts and it's hard to get to our, even our most basic spiritual practices of sitting in meditation or praying, sometimes it just feels like your prayers don't even go above your head. They just, it's hard to connect And what Dr. Chopra is showing us and what all the spiritual teachers are showing us is that even in, maybe especially in difficult times, to come back to spiritual truth and to choose a spiritual outlook and action and word is the way through it. And we will not only get through it without having to fast forward, we will be transformed in those one-day-at-a-time experiences. We will grow stronger, we will grow more capable, we will become more free to live a life that is exquisitely designed for us, even now, if we're willing to step into the divine flow of energetic um, movement, of, of being Yeah, the becomingness of God. Each of us, there's a, Hildegard of Bingen was a a German uh, mystic who lived in the Middle Ages, and she said that we are to live on the green and growing edge of our becoming. And how can you tell what the edge of your becoming is? Where does it hurt? Where is the place where you're struggling? Where is the place that it's harder to see the presence and power of God? Welcome to Green and Growing Edge. That is the invitation. And we're in a time where it's not only us individually going through some major growth and challenge things, but our world, our nation. And here is the beautiful part of that. How many lives are there? Unity, this is a trick question. One. There's one life. We are a part of the infinite life of spirit. And so when, we used to say a thing in in Al-Anon actually, that when when one person in the family gets better, the family gets better. And it's true of humanity. It's true of the cosmos. When any of us does our work in consciousness to heal our false beliefs, to release our limiting ideas of who and what we are, and we step into the possibility of our becoming, then the whole consciousness is raised a little bit. 
One of my teachers, Dr. Kathy Hearn, she said that when, when anyone heals a false belief, that belief is not only healed for themselves, but is healed for all people, past and future. That we are a part of the becomingness of God, a part of the evolution of spirit. And you have a part to play. That when you are willing, even when it hurts, to believe that God is here, when you are willing to choose a different path. I wasn't going to talk about this, but it just feels so right here today. It's hard. You know, we say, think a new thought, get a new experience. But it's hard because those thoughts are so ingrained, those thoughts of negativity and judgment and self-criticism, it's so deeply ingrained in us. My teacher explained it with this metaphor. It's like lawn bowling. You take a thought and you roll it down the lawn. Well, the first time that ball goes over the grass, what happens? The grass springs up. There is no path formed. And some of us have been rolling balls down that lawn a long time. Thoughts of not enough. Thoughts of self-defeating and critical thoughts. And so we have these ruts. And we'll try and get a new thought. I am enough. I am whole. I am good. And I'll roll that new thought and it just goes right back in the old rut. It's hard to do this. It takes time and diligence and practice. But over time, this is why we call it practice. If you're willing to take up this affirmative teaching in your prayer life, if you're willing to sit in the chair and still the mind a little bit every day, new grooves will be worn in your consciousness and you will shift into a higher way of being. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4, starting with verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. I feel like I need to read that part again. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Always. In good times and bad. Again, I say it. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. And this is the call This is the challenge. This is the graduate course of humanity and spiritual life that even when we find ourselves in a time of struggle, raise the thought higher. Raise the thought to possibility and keep it there to the best of your ability. There's a quote that is attributed to Gandhi, and I did a little research thanks to St. Google, and I've got some information for you. Be the change you wish to see in the world. No evidence Gandhi ever said it. But he lived it, and he taught it. And here is the actual quote that has been shortened a bit, but the, the longer quote is actually quite beautiful. We but mirror the world. All the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. This is the divine mystery supreme. A wonderful thing it is and the source of our happiness. We need not wait to see what others do. Mahatma Gandhi. I want to finish the message today by um, addressing what it means to live in times like ours. And I know so many of us just want it to be over. And believe me, I am so looking forward to the day that we can just welcome a full house in this sanctuary and hug each other and and we can see the, the freedom of actually, I mean, I can feel your smiles behind your mask, but I can actually see the smiles. I, I long for those days. But this day, 
with all of its challenges and all of the obstacles that we are encountering, is the right day for you to be here? Is the right day for me to show up as a son of God? Is the right day for me to discover my gifts? The right day for you to step into possibility thinking? This day, not in nine months or a year, today is the day. When I prepare my messages, I'm pretty intuitive about it. A few weeks ago, I talked about um, the, the, critic, the criticism, I guess, critique I get sometimes about, I use, some say I use too much Bible, some say I use not enough, and I had somebody this week call me and said, put me and my wife down for just right. That's a, you do it just right, not enough Bible. So I knew I love to tell stories, I love to teach from stories, because, you know, principle, law, it's great, but I need to, I need to kind of feel my way into, into a path of it. And hearing how someone else has stepped into something to illustrate a point, it makes it so much easier for me to get a hold of it. And so I was thinking, I think I've been heavy on the Bible lately. I don't, I don't think I want to teach from a Bible story. So I want to, I want to find a real-life story of someone who rose to the time in which they were born and the conditions in which they found themselves in. You know, the internet is a good place if you use it right. <laughs> I will tell you, there are a lot of wonderful things there. And I found literally hundreds of inspiring stories of people who faced incredibly difficult circumstances. And they lifted their thought and their eyes and they opened themselves to a greater possibility. They became the change they wanted to see in the world. And I want to share two of them with you. The first story I'd like to share with you today is about uh, Dashrath Manji, born in rural India to the lowest rung of the caste system, which meant that he did not have a lot of options or choices in his life. He was to live a life of manual labor, which he did, worked in agriculture and in coal mining, very poor. As a young man, his beloved wife had an accident. She was walking along a mountain path and fell. She was deeply injured, and um, she died because the nearest doctor was 34 miles away through the mountains. And this man, who has become known in India as the mountain man, he, in his sorrow and in his grief, rose. Something in him was called forward to, to bring a change. So Dashrath Manji, a coal miner, took a hammer and a chisel and began to cut a path through a mountain so that other people would have better access to care. For 20 years, by himself, with a hammer and a chisel, he cleared a path, and the 35-mile road to the doctor became nine miles. This is what um, he talked about. The road his path took from the 1960s into the 1980s. And he says this, Though most villagers taunted me at first, there were quite a few who lent me support later by giving me food and helping me buy my tools. Later, the, uh, the government widened the path that he'd created and created a, a true road between the villages, and so it, they're much less um, cut off and help is more easily available. He, they, the, the nation of India created a commemorative postage stamp in his honor, the lowest in the caste system, now honored by the whole nation. From his pain, he stepped into a possibility Though people were saying, it's useless, what are you doing? You're a, one man in a chisel against a mountain. He persevered. The other person that I want to talk to you about today is Desmond Doss. You may know him. There have been two feature movies made about his life and a, about a dozen books written about him. But Desmond Doss was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, to a family of devout Seventh-day Adventists. When World War II broke out and America entered the war, he wanted to serve his nation, but the Seventh-day Adventist faith is um, deeply pacifistic and does not believe in weapons or war or violence. But he did volunteer, and 
offered to be um, in any way they could use him, and he was trained to be a medic. He said that he would never, two things, he would not work on a Saturday, because that was a Sabbath day in his faith, and he would also not hold a weapon. So we've all been in those swells of nationalism, you know, those feelings like we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, we're going to destroy the bad guys. You know, we've all experienced that. That's just something that happens in humankind and history. And, and so if you can imagine a lot of young men training in the army, and here's this guy who won't pick up a rifle, who won't work on Saturday. Can you imagine the, the torment that he got? And he did. People, when he would be praying on a Saturday, his uh, fellow soldiers would uh, throw shoes at him. They would ridicule him to the point where they, they tried to get him kicked out of their unit. They took it up in the chain of command as far as they could. They hated him. But he was true to who he was. And he was trained to be a medic, and he was a good medic. And then there were different times when in they, the, his unit was deployed in the South Pacific, and he treated the wounded in a time of great danger to himself, and things began to change. But then on the island of Okinawa, at a place called Hatchet Ridge, the, uh, the United States forces were, were trying to take over the island, and there were a bunch of uh, Japanese um, soldiers that were in, and on the, on the higher ground, they were um, in some caves and rocks, and as the, the Americans would come over Hatchet Ridge to the higher place, the snipers would pick them off. And it was a really dangerous and hard time, and, and Desmond was part, as the medic of this, this unit. They were climbing up the ridge on rope ladders, and then and they were continuing to be shot. And to the point where there, were, there was no one left standing in his group that had scaled the ridge except for him. And so what he had to do, there was no reinforcements coming, he had to go get, find the wounded and bring them back so they could be lowered back down Hatchet Ridge. For a period of about six hours, with the snipers continuing to rain down fire upon him, he would put his own life at danger and he would find a fallen comrade and he would drag them back to safety. And when each one would be lowered down the ladder, he prayed to God, God, let me help one more. Let me help one more. In that three to six hour period, he saved 75 men. Some of the same men who had thrown shoes at him, who had reviled him, who had called him names, who had cursed him out, who had tried to get him out of their unit, he saved their lives. I'm sorry. I just, I'm surprised at how much it moved me, but it did. And I haven't even seen the movie yet. I hear it's really good, <laughs> for those of you who saw it. As for the men who had shamed him during boot camp, they had nothing but praise for him after war, after the war. He was, this is a quote from Captain Jack Glover, he was one of the bravest persons alive, and then to have him end up saving my life was the irony of the whole thing. Glover was one who had wanted Doss out of the unit when he first joined up. He received the Medal of Freedom, the highest honor ever given by this nation to a soldier who never picked up a weapon. I know none of us wanted to be here. This is not what we intended for this time in our collective lives. You know, I know for those who are here in the room, the first time if you came to a Sunday service, it feels weird. I know it does. We only have a few of us here, and we can't really feel the energy of each other because of the masks. And, but I see some of you coming back week after week, and you're finding the connection in other ways. But it's strange. It's a strange time for all of us. There's so much uncertainty. I don't even want to go into the division that we're still seeing in our political system. Somebody will be mad at me for just saying that. I mean, that's how it is these days. But what I'm, what I'm here to tell you is that you were made for this time. Just like Desmond Doss. The fact that you are here in this time, facing the difficulties that you're facing personally, that we're facing collectively, we need you. We need you 
God has created you, has, you have incarnated at this time to be here at your age, yes, in that family, yes, with your gifts and limitations. Now, today, you're needed. And I don't know what is yours to do. I think very few of us will be asked to do what Desmond did and save 75 fallen comrades in the middle of a war zone. But I do know that something is being asked of you to heal your own false beliefs and limiting ideas. Maybe all that's required, because that's not nothing. That when one of us gets better, we all get better. Oh. I'm so grateful that I get a chance to talk about what's in my heart every week. It would be really hard. Otherwise, I'd just be preaching to John. He would be so tired of it. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, thank you, Dave, for your Emerson quote. This is another that I'm sure we've heard before, but I love it. Emerson writes, What lies behind us and what lies before us are but tiny matters compared to what lies within us. What lies behind us, the history, the baggage, all those people that told you you weren't good enough and you believed. What lies behind us and what lies before us, the challenges, the unbelievable money problems we're facing, the unbelievable physical challenge you may be facing, whatever, what lies before us are but tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And to close... One of my favorite poems. I, we have a member of this community who is a, a, a Sufi. And I would o often read these translations by Daniel Ladinsky of the great poet Hafiz. And one day she said, Michael, those are beautiful, but they're not really translations of, of Hafiz. These are, they're sort of new poems inspired by. So this is a poem inspired by Hafiz, created by Daniel Ladinsky. You are the sun in drag. You are God hiding from yourself. Remove all the mine. That is the veil. Why, why ever worry about anything? Listen to what your friend Hafiz knows for certain. The appearance of this world is a magi's brilliant trick, though its affairs are nothing into nothing. But you... You are a divine elephant with amnesia trying to live in an ant hole. <laughs> sweetheart, oh, sweetheart, you are God in drag. I don't know what God wants to do in your life as your life, but I know it is magnificent. And if you want to be surrounded by a group of people who will love you into realizing your dreams, this may be the community for you because that's what we're about. And if no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. And if no one has told you today that you are amazing, you are amazing. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.